they obviously went to Frank Whittle and said, look, Germans are doing a thousand miles an hour, can you uh, produce an engine for this? And he said, well, by, by modifying this, I can make you a um, supersonic engine which will produce these very high thrusts at these very high speeds. Frank Whittle proposed a new massively enhanced jet engine to prove the capabilities of his invention. This would form the heart of a secret British plane to achieve the seemingly impossible task of breaking the sound barrier. It would carry Britain's hopes. Its name would be the M52. The contract was given to the specialized aircraft company Miles, based in Reading. Dennis Bancroft was Miles' chief aerodynamicist. He would have to call on all his ingenuity and imagination to achieve this miracle. The specification that Mr. Miles was given uh, consisted of six lines. First, to d design and produce an aircraft to fly at 1,000 miles an hour with this Whittle engine. And the one other thing was they wanted it in nine months, which was really um, pretty impossible. Dennis would have to reinvent everything then known about manned flight. He was full of ideas, as all the Miles team were. were innovation was the, the trump card of the Miles team. Miles was undoubtedly the best company to take on this job because of their innovative ideas and designs. They were always ahead of the rest of the, the firms in the country at the time. Many leading scientists told Dennis he was wasting his time, that it was impossible. It was obviously something that nobody had ever done or even thought of doing before, and it was going to be very early for jet engines as well. The modest Miles team now led the way in what was about to become a global challenge. How could they get a man to fly through the sound barrier and survive? Abandoning every existing design concept, gradually a completely new aircraft shape evolved. More sci-fi than sci-fact. The basic shape of the fuselage was based on the shapes obtained from bullet firing tests um, of, at supersonic speeds. Bullets were the only things then known to fly supersonically or beyond the speed of sound. At miles, Designer Dennis Bancroft hoped the M52's slender wings would provide less resistance in high-speed flight, but would they work at low takeoff and landing speeds? The new ultra-thin wings were tested on a small training aircraft. It was nicknamed the Gillette because it was so sharp. And our engineers were wrapped up in sticky plaster because they were getting cut, they were so sharp. The razor edge sliced through the air and the wings proved to function well. Making up ground, the de Havilland Swallow and the Bell X-1 both quickly went from the drawing board to the production line in less than a year. But with Whittle's enhanced engine, providing the required 6,000 pounds of thrust. It looked certain that Britain's M52 would soon be the first to break the barrier. The tailplane on traditional aircraft only possessed a small moving section, useless against compressibility when approaching the sound barrier. The M52's tailplane would be one solid piece 
and the whole thing would move. It was hoped that this all-moving tailplane would give test pilot Eric Brown more control. It was an innovative design of gigantic proportions. We were moving into a completely new era of flight. And here we were, top of the heap, so to speak, I would say 15 months ahead of the Americans that stage. By 1946, we had reached about 80% completion of the aeroplane, and it would have flown supersonically in um, about three months to time. The Miles team felt proud of what they had achieved in two years, until some shocking news arrived. On the 13th of March, My F.G. Miles received um, a message um, cancelling the M52 and saying that they were not interested in us continuing it with it. Without warning, the government scrapped the M52, the leading contender in the race to break the sound barrier. The cancellation of the M52 was without doubt the most catastrophic event in the annals of British aviation and when the news was announced to FG Miles there was nothing but dismay in the drawing offices they were completely dumbfounded. Well I mean we were extremely disgusted with the whole thing. Great uh, disappointment and bewilderment because uh, we were all certain that it was going to be a success. For the man who would have been the first to try and take the M52 through the sound barrier, it was devastating news. I was hopping mad because I felt that we were on the road to success and there was no, in my opinion, no logical explanation to justify this cancellation. The government never provided any real justification. There were a multitude of reasons given, none of which were, I believe, anything but red herrings. Various sources blame politics, escalating costs, disputes with Frank Whittle, the lack of a swept wing, and even the risk to the test pilot. And I said, well, since I was going to be the pilot, why hadn't I been asked whether I was had any worries about or concerns? But I got nowhere, I'm afraid, on that line. <clears throat> Almost 60 years later, it is still not known why the groundbreaking M52 was cancelled. But its innovations would live to fly another day. My personal view is that when we handed over all the data, we gave the Americans the flying tail. American government scientists had put the need for a moving tailplane in the X-1 specification. This feature was in the original Bell design, but wasn't particularly designed with that in mind. It was just happy use of a, of a facility which was already there. The British claimed to know exactly what it was there for. A uh, moving tailplane is absolutely essential to a supersonic aeroplane. It was known in 43, therefore we put it on. Frankly, I do not believe that they could have gone supersonic with, so early without the data we passed on to them. Almost exactly a year after Jaeger's historic flight, the British M52 had its own moment of glory. Britain had continued its research into high-speed flight using unmanned test vehicles. In 1948, a rocket-powered scale model of the M52 was dropped from a mother plane and quickly broke the sound barrier. Along with tests conducted by Rolls-Royce in the 1970s, this seemed to prove the M52 would have flown at 1,000 miles per hour, about one and a half times the speed of sound. Dennis Bancroft and the M52 had been vindicated and the de Havilland team won the runners-up prize in 1948 
when a DH-108 Swallow also achieved Mark 1 in an uncontrolled dive. <laughs>